Welcome everybody to another broadcast uh, from Vic South Star Party. Um, my name is Kim Thalassoudis. I'm the current president of the Astronom Society of South Australia. Joining me today is Dr. Russell Cockman and uh, Lee from his front yard and Russ from under a, a sheet or a towel, I believe, outside oh. in his laptop. Welcome. Okay, so before we start, I'd just like to say uh, that in the spirit of rec reconciliation, our astronomical societies acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So um, by way of introduction, I know that um, Lee is on uh, the ASV committee and is also supports the website and other IT work. Welcome, Lee. And uh, Russ um, is the director of the solar section, has been since 2013. Um, and he admits to having learnt an awful lot about the sun during that time, which is a really good thing because he's out there. He's going to be showing it to us today. Um, so I don't think, oh, but you're also the president of the International Dark Sky Association of Victoria. What a contradiction that might, that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, 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 the life is full of contradictions, Kim. This is one of them. Anyway. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's, That's great to know. And by the way, just out of interest, our, our society is hosting um, uh, 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 the director of the Dark Sky Reserve, the International Dark Sky Reserve, the River Murray International Dark Sky Reserve, at our yep. meeting on Wednesday. And um, that site was, um, I think it's about 3,200 square kilometres of dark sky. Right. It's been yep. preserved in SA, just near Adelaide. Yep. So we're looking forward to getting an update on that next Wednesday. It's a very talk interesting well. talk, for sure. Mm. All right. Well, um, let's get underway then. Um, let's start with you, Russ. You've got a presentation there. Yeah. And uh, people, please ask questions. I mean, this is going to be a uh, pretty fascinating presentation. And we have clear weather both in Victoria and South, or well, most of Victoria and South Australia today. So yeah. over to you when you're ready, Russ. Well, thank you very, very much for that, Kim. And uh and um, well done on uh, your presidency of the uh, uh, of ASA. And um, so this is uh, so welcome to the solar uh, demonstration from Elwood, which is just six kilometres from Melbourne's CBD. Our forecast is for uh, clear blue skies today, and uh, no earthquakes are, uh, are forecast uh, for us. So we should um, have no uh, no interruptions whatsoever. But before we have a look at the sun. It is very, very important to learn a little bit about uh, safe solar viewing. So I have a, a presentation here that I will uh, start off the, the demonstration with. A little bit about uh, safe solar viewing. And um, so here we go. Let's go. So there's our beautiful star, not in the, uh, the the kind of light that we can see. Very, very powerful uh, source of energy, as we uh, well aware. I'm in the sun at the moment. I'm, I can feel the heat of the sun on my skin. But there's a, a serious warning when we consider observing the sun, because unlike the stars we see in the night sky, we must never, ever look directly at, at our sun uh, with a telescope, binoculars, or even our eyes because permanent injury to our eyes may result from that few seconds of uh, carelessness always use proper filtration to reduce the sun's light and most importantly the sun's heat before looking at it if you've ever held a, a, a little magnifying glass in the sunshine and, and focused it on your skin you realize how much heat is focused onto that little area of your skin. And that's what happens to your eyes if you're uh, foolish enough to look at the, the sun uh, without proper filtration. And there are, there are two basic ways of looking at the sun. This is by uh, direct observation. And the first one is uh, called white light observation. And here's a, an example. So you have a telescope. This happens to have a binocular viewer on it. And this is a refracting telescope. It means it's got lenses up the front. And the, uh, the safe solar filter goes over the front here, which is a metallized, a thin sheet of plastic. 
and basically most of the sun's uh, energy, light and heat is reflected off that, um, that filter uh, back towards where the sun uh, comes from and perhaps only 0.00001% of the sun's energy passes through that filter which reduces the amount of uh, solar energy to uh, a safe level. Now uh, Lee has got a setup at the moment um, where uh, we can have a look at the sun in white light. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing and uh, over to you Lee. Hey, um, I've just got a region of interest at the moment on a couple of um, sunspots, but I'll just take that back out. And, oops, nope, nope, nope. Clicking all over the place. So there it is there. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've got... Uh, um, I've got a Celestron Edge 8, uh, Edge HD 8 um, telescope with uh, pretty much exactly that same uh, metallized solar film on the front for, for white light. Um, and I think at the moment, it's also, in, I've got filters on this as well, so it's also using infrared just to uh, reduce the heat a little bit more as well before hitting the, um, the sensor. But um, yeah, I get a fantastic view of that and I can, um, take video that's currently at three milliseconds uh the shot so it's probably a bit fast for for taking video at the moment um but i can take some video of that and do some uh some lucky imaging and stacking and get some what i think are some brilliant um solar images and lee just to cut in what what are you seeing mm. here okay there's the disc of the sun and uh, what are those little dark things on there so there's are a couple of dark? uh uh, no, not not in this case. Uh, it was really? last night. I had a dust donut right in the middle of um, uh, right in the middle of the viewing area. Uh, but in this case, it's see if we move the uh, the telescope, they move as well. Which typically, oh, if uh, yeah. if they were dust, yep, they would uh, they would remain in place. So, and we've got another and couple up the top. So, so we call these sunspots. So they are features on the sun on the uh, on this layer of the sun that we're looking at at the moment in white light which is called the photosphere that dazzlingly bright surface of the sun that uh, lights our world the photosphere so what's what's the temperature of the sun the solar surface and what's the temperature say within a sunspot do you have, do you know that russ yeah um about five and a half thousand uh, degrees celsius uh, is the average temperature of the photosphere and those sunspots, although they look dark, they're only a couple of hundred degrees cooler. Mm. So it's it's all a matter of uh, contrast. Um, mm. In fact, uh, it has been said that if you could isolate a sunspot and, and look at it, it would be as bright as the average uh, photosphere of the sun. So it is all just a matter of uh, contrast, subtle differences in temperature, and uh, which makes things white or dark. Mm. That's a nice view. That is nice, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, just uh, stretched. I actually, uh, I'm, uh, I'm cutting off some of the light now to give it some contrast. So excellent. Yep. And um, is that as have you have you fine focused, Lee? I I, I did, but really? I do have a bit of trouble focusing sometimes on this. And okay. uh, um, I did focus earlier, but it could well have been out because I've also moved it slightly. No worries. Could you just go back to that else. zoomed? Could you just go back to that zoomed view? Yes. Yeah. Let me just uh, go back in there. And all right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, girls, and boys, we're seeing a, a, a lovely, very safe view of uh, these uh, sunspots. Quite a few of them, and hopefully, you can see in the photosphere around those sunspots some subtle light and shade areas. And once again, these are true uh, features on the sun's photosphere, and that's called granulation. Granulation, because this layer of the sun, um, the energy um, rises up from the hot uh, central core of the sun, rises up in, um, in convection cells. Hot gas rises up as it rises up, it cools, and then the cooler gas 
uh, only being a couple of hundred degrees cooler, just uh, is more dense and it just uh, flows down towards the uh, the center of the sun again, and uh, so they are uh, called, uh, that's called granulation. And really, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, girls and boys, this is about all you can usefully see with uh, white light filtering. Beautiful views of sunspots, of granulation, and uh, sometimes some slightly whiter areas called faculae on the edge of the sun. And uh, sunspots are given numbers for reference, and this sunspot group we're looking at is called AR2891. So the numbers are given simply for um, for reference for future work on these um, sunspots, i.e. To, uh, to refer to this particular group um, as a as whatever it did sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much for that, Lee. I think I shall uh, go back to my uh, my presentation if that's yep. if you've no uh, shown everything you'd like to show. Okay, thanks very much. You'll have to share that again, Russ. Yes, okay, I'll, uh, I shall do that. Thanks, Kim. Uh, here we go. So that's the white light view. Fantastic for uh, sunspots, uh, some granulation. Uh, but if we go on to... And so that's, that's similar to what we saw just now. But then we have observing in what is called hydrogen alpha. And uh, so this is the setup that, that is currently on, uh, on my balcony at my uh, apartment here, the uh, uh, Astronomical Society's 100 millimeter Lunt solar telescope on a mount that's roughly polar aligned. And uh, at the end here, there's, well, there's my tail. It's over my uh, overhead, my head now as a laptop. And here's a video camera, um, which uh, gives live video that we will see very, very shortly. And uh, if we were doing visual observations of the sun, this is how the sun would appear. A beautiful radiant red disk with, uh, with sunspots on it. Some active uh, regions here around those sunspots. And most importantly, prominences around the edge of the sun. Hopefully you can see those very, very clearly indeed. So, in fact, when we use a hydrogen alpha filter to look at the sun, we're actually looking at a slightly different layer of the sun. This layer is slightly above the photosphere, slightly cooler, and it's a region which is called the chromosphere. Now, for those of you who are listening to Rod earlier, he mentioned uh, the chromosphere, uh, which becomes visible just a few seconds um, before a total eclipse of the sun when the moon has covered up the brilliant photosphere, but this little layer of chromosphere being above the photosphere uh, gets covered by the moon just a second or two after the uh, photosphere gets covered up. And it is it is the source of the uh, these beautiful uh, red prominences that we see around the, uh, the uh, sun's disk. Now we talk about solar activity and it is now well known that when uh, sometimes we, when we look at the sun over here on the left, there are lots of sunspots. Other times when we look at the sun, there are no spots at all. And uh, this was sort of discovered in the uh, early 1800s. And with more observations, more data, it was discovered that the sun has an 11 year cycle. So on the, uh, on, on the vertical axis here is a number called the sunspot number. Basically count the number of sunspots visible on the sun and do a little bit of mathematics to it and do it day by day. And you can see that over the years, 1760, 1880, uh, the number of sunspots visible rises to a maximum, then goes down to effectively zero, rises up to a maximum, goes down to a zero, roughly every 11 years. On average, 11 years, but it could be 13, it could be nine, but on average, 11 years. And here it is, continuing from the 1880s up to the present era, the solar cycle. And you'll notice that solar activity is measured by the number of uh, sunspots. It's not constant either. It, it varies from one cycle to the next. And uh, this was, uh, and in fact, uh, these solar cycles are given numbers. This was cycle 24, this one here that I've uh, indicated. And uh, continuing, right up to now you can see that 
from uh, 2010 to now, the sun has gone through another solar cycle up to a maximum, actually two maxima, one here and one there, before steadily declining in the sunspot numbers down to a time for uh, for the la uh, latter half of 2019, when there was barely a sunspot visible on the sun for uh, months on end, barely a sunspot visible. But the sun has woken up and uh, after from 2020 onwards, you can see the sunspot number is, is rising up and we're expecting another solar maximum somewhere around late 2024 uh, into 2025. Now, what does all this mean? It, it, it doesn't mean that the sun's um, heat and light varies, but it means that the sun's magnetic characteristics are varying over this 11 year cycle because it's the sun's magnetics which changes the number of sunspots, changes the number of flares that the sun gives out, changes the uh, visible, visibility of uh, the southern lights or the northern lights. So it's all down to the magnetic uh, variability of the sun, which really was only discovered through uh, launch of uh, solar probes like SOHO, uh, which is the Solar Heliospheric Observatory or the Solar Dynamics Observatory, where these uh, observatories in space could actually measure the magnetic characteristics of the sun and tie it up with uh, the changes in the sunspot number, amongst other things. Okay, so, uh, so that, and what really is a lead-in to uh, what we're going to see today. So the, the sun's activity on, is on a rise. It's nowhere near solar maximum. And um, so let's see what the sun has got to offer today. In short, so I shall uh, share again. And please keep those questions coming. I love questions. So when when is solar, when is the next solar maximum forecast um, for it's, on that? It's not, it's not predictable as such. We can just give a, um, when I say we, solar scientists, a window of, of 2024 to 2025 sort of thing. Hmm. Okay, so uh, it all depends on uh, what kind of uh, model is used for it. But we are uh, a few years off yet. Okay. So here we go. Hopefully you can see that. This is a view of the sun through the hydrogen alpha telescope. Now, one thing I didn't mention is this video camera is a monochrome camera. It only shows um, levels of gray, gray scale. In fact, it shows better images of the sun than if it was a, uh, a color camera because, um, bearing in mind, you, the, sun, uh, the eye is very, diff uh, very sensitive to changes in the shades of gray, but not so sensitive to changes in um, levels of red. So uh, looking at the sun in, in shades of gray does highlight features uh, far more effectively. So here's the view through the, the, uh, the video camera. Here's the sun up here. So now I'm going to get my mount control and uh, move the sun towards the center of the field of view. There we go, I'm moving the mount now, which is moving the telescope, bringing the sun into the field of view. So this is a an absolute setup, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You notice the sun is fuzzy. That's because I haven't focused the telescope. Very, very important to focus. So I'll focus it now, just adjusting the focuser. You can see the sun is starting to get a little bit sharper, a little bit sharper. Here we are. We can see some sunspots now. Wow, look at that. Uh, also, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, this is this is... What, how we would set it up. Now you notice that the uh, the sun up here is, is really burnt out, we would say. It's overexposed, and, but down here it's, it's nicely exposed. And uh, this is because uh, the hydrogen alpha um, bandwidth, the amount of uh, light that the, uh, the solar telescope lets through, um, is very, very narrow, and the sun is rotating. So it means that some parts of the sun uh, can appear darker than other parts. So the wonderful feature of the solar telescopes is they that they have a tuning facility. So I'm just going to be cranking in the tuning now, and you'll see that the bit that's overexposed is now becoming better exposed. It's losing its brightness, and uh, I'm looking for a a setting, which is a, a completely a manual uh, just screwing out of a, a knob to get the sun pretty well evenly exposed and I reckon that's about it actually. 
I will give the uh, the camera a little bit more exposure. There we are. Perhaps a little bit more. So this is a special solar telescope, Russell. A, a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. Right. Yes. So, so not, um, is this something you can but, add to a regular telescope, or do you have to buy the telescope you, as is? Um, well, a, a very good question, Kim. And um, modern uh, systems, yes, you can take a, a standard refractor that uh, you'd use for observing the night sky, and you can uh, put a hydrogen alpha uh, filter on the front of it to convert it into a, a solar uh, telescope like this. And uh, there are some uh, companies out there that uh, do exactly that. They provide a dual purpose uh, telescope that is suitable for night viewing and also suitable for uh, solar viewing. So please mm. bear in mind this telescope as set up, it's only good for solar viewing. It's a single purpose telescope. Okay. I reckon it's a, a brilliant idea to um, provide or offer a telescope that can do both things, can be used for nighttime viewing and for uh, solar viewing as well, uh, not only in hydrogen, also, alpha, but, but in other colours as well. In, yeah, in addition to the hazards of uh, looking at the sun, look or pointing your telescope at the sun um, with a regular telescope and the, the, the personal hazards, you'll also destroy it uh, almost mm, certainly, correct. I imagine as well. So uh, don't ever <laughs> point at the sun unless you absolutely know what you're doing. But uh, it's correct. interesting to know that you can actually convert or yes. uh, adapt a regular telescope to um, a solar yes. telescope with the right gear. Yes, uh, uh, the, the thing that does the, uh, the filtering is called an etalon, and these can be designed for filtering particular bands of, uh, of light. So you can get a hydrogen alpha etalon, or you can get a calcium etalon, showing the, uh, the sun in a different color and, and observing a different layer of the sun as well. So every, it's a bit like an onion, actually. You look at a different color and you're seeing slightly different characteristics of the sun. So here's the full view of the sun, and, and ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, this is probably has to be the safest way to observe the sun because you're not, not actually looking at it. It's, uh, it's a video <laughs> view of the sun in uh, effectively real time, although it takes uh, 8 minutes and 20 seconds for uh, light to uh, reach the Earth from the sun, but it's as close to real time as we can possibly see. So there's the, there's the disk of the sun, and uh, you can see... And I'll show you some uh, close-ups as we go along, but here's a sunspot group here, and here's a, here's a most likely is a flare taking place. This uh, bright white area, which is an indication that that area is a few hundred degrees hotter than the uh, average chromosphere temperature, and that appears white to us. So this is a, we call this an active region because uh, magnetic lines of force are coming through the chromosphere and creating sunspots and those magnetic lines of force are joining together liberating huge amounts of magnetic energy stored energy which uh, creates flares explosions and uh, in fact um, this uh, this sunspot group over here which has got a number of 2887 i think it is i'll just check my uh, my crib sheet yep 2887 a couple of days ago uh, when it was was in this position, because the sun does rotate from from uh, from here or in that direction, but that sunspot group was about here, and uh, it erupted in what is known as an X-class flare, which is a very powerful flare, which sent um, a huge cloud of uh, of plasma, solar stuff, uh, racing uh, in the direction of Earth, and it was expected to arrive by now, but um, it might arrive tonight, and if it does, mm. uh, Southern Australia and New Zealand will be a perfect, and Tasmania, I'm not going to forget about the uh, Tasmanians, but and, and the South Australians, it will be perfectly placed to hopefully observe the uh, display of the Aurora Australis. So this is stuff that uh, left the sun two, maybe three days ago, it takes its time to get to Earth, but when it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, it can create uh, displays of the aurora australis for us in the southern hemisphere and the aurora borealis for uh, residents of the northern hemisphere of the earth hmm. oh that's fascinating the um, that sunspot group on the right is that the one that we were looking at initially uh, with correct the yes through uh, through lee's i've got a slightly hmm. different orientation uh, to um, to what lee has got but uh, ladies and gentlemen here's our full sun subtends about uh, one half of one degree uh, angle in the sky 
And let's see what uh, prominences might be visible around the edge of the sun. So I'll uh, just change the exposure on the camera, crank it up fully. So I'm overexposing the chromosphere in the hope of bringing out prominences around the edge. And as you can see, it doesn't look like there are many prominences visible today, but I have a little bit of more oomph that I can provide. And you can see that, yes, there we are. There's a, a few prominences, fairly small ones um, becoming visible around the edge of the sun here. Um, one over here and one here. Now, which is a little bit disappointing because a, a, a few days ago, there were lots and lots and lots of uh, prominences around the sun, but I do have a video that I took then that I can show at the uh, end of this demonstration. Now, to, show, to see so the prominences, you can, all you did there was just effectively change exposure or gain. Is that right? The Russell? gain, correct. Yes. Okay. There's something, make, uh, something significant make, there. To make on fainter, the right -hand side. Is, Oh yeah, and on the right hand here. side. Look at this. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, no worries, ladies and gentlemen. We can um, zoom in though on those. No worries at all. This is just a teaser. Well spotted. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a teaser or a tempter. So I'm just reducing the exposure now, so we've got our chromosphere well exposed. And here's a. Uh, Here's a point of information for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and girls and boys. So here's the diameter of the sun across here. The sun is a, effectively a sphere. And imagine you can fit 109 Earths across that diameter. 109 Earths will fit across the diameter of the sun. And that means over 1 million Earths will fit or could fit inside the sun. Just to give you an idea of how big our sun is compared with the Earth. So when we have a look at one of these sunspots, we think, oh, that's not very big, is it? You know, curling up the, uh, the corner of your mouth, that's a pretty small spot. But when you think of it, um, one or two Earths could probably fit inside that with some room to, sh uh, to, room to spare. Okay? So it's always uh, important to put uh, things into perspective. Our mm. sun is a, a beautiful star and a slightly uh, larger than average star. And... Uh, how beautiful it is to be able to study a star up so close. Okay, so there's our uh, our sun. We've we've seen the full disk. Okay, uh, perhaps I should point out some uh, largish overall features here. So here's an active region. Uh, that's um, two eight eight nine, I think it is. Two eight eight seven here. Two um, anyway, like I forgot that number, <laughs> but uh, but never mind. But if you look, but if you look very, very carefully, you can see that the entire chromosphere is mottled. Some uh, whiter, lighter areas and some darker areas. So that's exactly the same granulation that we saw in the white light image. Only uh, this is a slightly more contrast to make these uh, features a little bit uh, easier to see. And you can see a feature here, this dark feature here, and features over here. These are called filaments. So these are actually prominences seen silhouetted against the chromosphere. And because prominences are a little bit cooler, they're a little bit further from um, the source of energy, they're, they're a little bit cooler than the average temperature of the chromosphere. And because temperature makes things light or dark, that difference in temperature is enough to uh, make these filaments stand out as slightly darker patches against the, uh, the brighter chromosphere. Okay. Let's home in on on this active region here. So I can simply do that by drawing a, a field of view around it, doing that. Well, that looks quite small, but I can magnify it. Bang! Here we go. Ooh. How good is that, eh? Now Excellent. I'm going to do a little bit of fine focus on this because I want you to see, and I'm just touching the focusing tube right now, just finding the sharpest focus I can. Now, isn't that gorgeous? Hmm. Don't all shout at once, but it certainly <laughs> it is. How gorgeous is that? So a couple of sunspots here. Magnetic lines of force are breaking through the, the chromosphere, and when they break through, they create uh, slightly cooler areas around it, and we see those as, those as darkness. And here we have a couple of explosions taking place on the sun, which we call flares. These are probably fairly uh, low-energy flares, ranked probably a... Uh, a high B class or a low C class, fairly low energy. Um, 
that X-class flare I mentioned earlier on uh, would be uh, about a thousand times more energetic than a, uh, a C-class flare uh, or a B-class flare in comparison. But nevertheless, these flares are, um, what can we say, are, are producing prodigious amounts of energy, which can uh, create prominences, uh, these so-called flames or apparent flames that jut into space and, uh, and filaments as well. But have a look. So here's the general chromosphere around here, just, just general little mottling light and gray areas. But in the region of a sunspot, the chromosphere starts to get structures. You know, it starts to show curves, curved like structures and, uh, and structures going out. That's because the magnetic uh, lines of force are very, very complicated around uh, active regions. And uh, plasma um, being charged particles has to follow those lines of force if, uh, if it's going to move at all. And so these, these structures here are actually uh, um, indicating the magnetic lines of force coming through the chromosphere. And I guess look, a lot of us have, uh, when we were young, got a bar magnet and put some paper on it and sprinkled some iron filings on the bar magnet. And you can see the magnetic lines of force coming out of the North Pole and, uh, and the South Pole of that bar magnet. And that's exactly what we are in, in like sort of uh, terms here are um, seeing the magnetic lines of force coming from deep inside the sun and breaking through the sun's um, mm -hmm. chromosphere. So Russell, is it common for sunspots to appear in pairs like that? Absolutely, very good question, Kim. That's right, because mm -hmm. uh, um, magnet magnetics must always have a north pole and a south pole, right? So uh, one of these sunspots will be the magnetic north and the other will be the magnetic south of uh, of that magnetic line of force that is coming out. Yeah. So and that's a fairly simple looking uh, sunspot pair. But when you realize that the more complex sunspots get, the more complex the magnetic uh, fields are that are creating those sunspots. And the more complex a sunspot is, the more magnetic lines of force there is available and the more stored magnetic energy there is. So uh, big sunspots, complex ones, are generally the source of um, these uh, la uh, large and energetic flares that uh, we are uh, looking forward to as the sun rises to solar max in, uh, in two to three years time. Fantastic, eh? Mm. As I said before, that looks like a small spot, but probably one or two Earths could fit inside that uh, with no problem at all. And this, the temperature of this flare might be well over 6,000 degrees uh, Celsius and inevitably blasting a little bit of uh, solar stuff into uh, space. Not enough to um, reach Earth, but uh, certainly enough to uh, reveal a prominence um, in due course. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at another sunspot group. So here's our sun again. Here's a beautiful region over here. So I'll just draw, I think I'll draw a, a region there. And we'll do the same thing and zoom in, bing. One thing I haven't mentioned, the, the sun is jittering around. And it looks like it's sort of sharpening and getting fuzzy. That's actually an effect of the Earth's atmosphere. It's, um, uh, it's not directly um, uh, due to the sun itself, but it's simply because we're looking through an, uh, the Earth's atmosphere and uh, observing in daytime where the sun's energy is being absorbed by buildings and roadways, etc. Those, those things are getting hot, causing uh, air to heat up and rise up, and it causes these, uh, what we call seeing. It causes... Um, changes in the uh, the light path uh, that gets to the telescope and we see that as a little bit of uh, blurring fuzzing and uh, boiling so this sunspot here which is 2887 it was a sunspot that was responsible for the uh, x1 flare that uh, erupted uh, three days ago uh, which sent a, a huge uh, cloud of uh, of charged gas earthwards and um, we're still expecting it uh, to arrive 
and and um, hopefully it will arrive tonight. So if uh, if the skies are clear, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, get away from uh, uh, light polluted uh, city streets and what have you, and uh, try and find a nice uh, place with a, a nice dark view to the south. You might see some colours in the sky, the aurora australis, and lots, yeah. lots more to look forward to. How good is that? Now, I should also point out that the sun, like most things in the universe, is uh, rotating. And it takes about uh, 27 days for the equator of uh, the sun to do one uh, rotation, but that period of time increases. As, this, as we go from the sun's equator towards the poles. And so a, um, a sunspot, if there was one near the pole, would take about 35 days to complete a rotation. Unlike us standing on the uh, planet Earth, whether we're at the equator or at the pole, it, it still takes one day for us to do one rotation. That's because the Earth is a solid body. Now, um, solar scientists back in the... Um, early 1800s through careful observations of sunspots and how they uh, appear to change position over days uh, realized that crikey the uh, rotation period of a sunspot uh, depends on on how close to the sun's equator it is so, so therefore simply based on these observations people concluded quite rightly that the sun is not solid but a huge ball of gas and how incredible is that? Simply through observing uh, how long it takes sunspots to rotate, they were able to confirm which was a, a, a massive um, observation or conclusion that the sun is not a solid body, but a huge ball of gas. And of course, then that raised the question, well, gee, if it's a huge ball of gas, how, um, how can it have supplied energy for so, so many millions or even billions of years. Mm -hmm. So we have a question there. I have a question yeah. there from Peter. Russ. Hello, Peter. Um, yeah, he just wants to clarify that black spot to the left is what we're referring to as a as a um, sunspot, right? This is a In sunspot. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's a sunspot. That's a flare here. Yep. So the bright ones are flares, and the black ones are the black sunspots. Ones are sunspot, yeah. Okay. So the flares are <laughs> magnetic uh, magnetic energy just being uh, liberated and heating up the surrounding area. A little bit and uh, there we have it yep so lots and lots of granulation here lots of whitish areas which are active regions active we, we call them because they are liberating energy a little bit more energy than the average uh, region is doing and um, and as I say these active regions are the regions that um, we we define as solar activity so those those regions are actually changing with time over the course yes. of what minutes or hours if we um, came back and had a look. well over 15 minutes half an hour yes okay. so if if we could have a look at this region in an hour's time we would probably find that this region would have um, would not be as bright then as it is now because uh, flares only last for you know 20 minutes, half an hour, all depends on how uh, powerful they are. And uh, over a period of days, sunspots will change their appearance because the sun is just an incredibly dynamic object. It's just a huge source of power, and that power changes in, um, well, in, uh, in a period of hours to, uh, to days. How fabulous. A filament here. So let's go back and uh, see what else we can see. Keep those questions coming. There's our sun. <coughs> filaments here, granulation, lots of active uh, regions here. Another filament there. Let's just zoom in on this filament and see what we can see. Here we are. Filament here filament there. Now, it, it will be amazing to learn that these filaments aren't there for no reason at all. These, these filaments are there because 
there's a magnetic line of force which is holding up the gas that uh, is is that filament and uh, sometimes you may get that uh, those magnetic lines of force uh, will uh, will reconnect is the scientific term and as they reconnect all that stored magnetic energy is liberated it's a, uh, i don't recommend you do this but um if you just take one of your little uh, say aa batteries and uh, just uh, short out the the two terminals that wire uh, the, the uh, conducting wire uh, will get very very hot indeed so in other words you've got um stored energy in the battery but if you short it out uh, all that energy is then liberated as heat in the conducting wire and that's effectively what we're seeing here we have magnetic lines of force which are separated and that all that, uh, that stored energy is is stored but when those two lines of uh, force come together reconnect all that energy has to go somewhere and it ends up as heat and that uh, filament can be blasted into space as a, what we call a coronal mass ejection and hence could uh, lead to uh, some minor auroral activity visible on the earth as long as um, as long as conditions are uh, are correctly set up for doing that yep some filaments now we think oh gee they're pretty small aren't they but i reckon we could probably fit uh, 10 earths along this uh, filament here just to give you an idea of the, the size of it uh, the, remember the uh, diameter of the earth is about 14,000 kilometers so five earths we're looking at about uh, 70,000 kilometers so i think you've answered this question already russ and um, the right. temperature variation yeah from, just a few uh, hundred right degrees a yeah. few hundred degrees so a, a slightly a darker panel. region like this is a few hundred degrees cooler uh, than mm. average temperature and the an active region uh, will be a few hundred degrees hotter and as i said that's just enough to make things look white or dark in this particular band of uh, color that we're looking at but the absolute temperature is around six thousand degrees c close to, yeah five and a half six thousand yeah half. that's the okay. ballpark yep yeah. okay now, hopefully you're enjoying these views, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, look at those really delicate structures that appear when uh, there's a moment of quite still air visible. And the wonderful thing about taking a video is that because uh, at the moment, um, my frame rate, which is this number over here, I've, I've set a maximum of 100, 100 frames per second. So in other words, that's 100 uh, still frames every second which which are combined together to make this video so if i recorded this video uh for uh, for 30 seconds that means i've got 30 times 100 still frames that i can work with and it's inevitable that quite a few of those still frames will be taken when the earth's atmosphere is still and sharp getting sharp images so this is the beauty of taking videos in order to um Put that video into a program which selects those the sharpest of those frames puts them together stacks them up and from that absolutely awesome still images of this of whatever the sun the planets um can be um achieved and it's just a, hmm. a, a fabulous uh, technique for for astrophotography of, uh, of bright objects Keep those questions coming. So there we have it. So I think I will expand uh, the exposure, crank it up, and we'll just home in on um, one of one of the prominences. As I said, oh yes, there's a nice prominence over here. Oh, this is the one you were teasing us with earlier. Oh, look, I'm a teaser. There we are. <laughs> look at that. I'll just back off on that, that again a little bit. Look at that. Yep. Yep. I feel like I can almost reach out and touch it, but I, I shouldn't it does. do that because it's still very yeah. hot. <laughs> okay. But there you go. What beautiful structures are present in that. So this is clearly has been an explosion on the sun. And put into context, to some, uh, to some extent, hundreds of thousands or millions of atom bomb blasts all combined together to produce the energy to um, create one of these things it is just 
prodigious. Awesome. And I know that word awesome is bandied around, but this is truly awesome. <laughs> There's a, several bright knots in it here and there and all this structure. All that shaking around is perhaps me just banging the uh, my, my patio floor or <laughs> um, minor earth tremors going through, ha, ha, ha. Or <laughs> most likely just uh, the earth's atmosphere. <laughs> How awesome is that? So is the now, ladies and gentlemen, is following the magnetic field lines as well? In general, yes, yes. Okay. Very, very complex. Yep. That, that one's sort of got a, it's got a bit of an odd shape compared to some I know we've seen yes. before. Is would it be possible that that's actually two prominences? Very, very. Uh, very uh, likely uh, Lee yeah, very very good that uh, we're effectively seeing the sun in two dimensions a two-dimensional mm -hmm. view we should remember it is a three-dimensional object so there is a, a front and back kind of perspective that uh, we're not picking up here but that could well be um, two prominences um, overlapping yeah mm -hmm. two two arcs in other words yeah because so, you can see um, just just at below and to the right, there's a just a tiny little speck right that um, uh, no to down down and to the right. So to the right now, a bit further, a bit oh. further across. No, out and out and yeah, just there, right where the mouse is. Right. You can sort of see okay. a little bit just under under where the mouse is. Okay, well, I'll crank up the gain a little bit more. Yeah, as though one of those sort of parts is is following that line out and oh, going yes. back around the back. So the, uh, these prominences are clearly uh, separated from the sun. You know, there's the, there's the oh, actual yeah. edge of the sun just there, one and a prominence down here. But if I, naturally, if I increase the gain, that tends to uh, sort of scatter light within the chip that I'm using and makes the, the edge of the sun expand a little bit. Hmm. But uh, there we have it. I'm, uh, I'm going to see what else is present on the sun using this it's probably the most interesting feature that we have it so I'll just return the exposure to normal for the chromosphere, oops, and reduce the gain up here. Lots of things to play around with. Oop, too much. So we have gain another question good. here, uh, Russ. Certainly. Just quickly. Um, and I think if I read this correctly, uh, can what we're seeing here affect our uh, temperature on Earth? and in particular impact climate change? Well, that's a can of worms. <laughs> um, well, uh, climate scientists are aware that, um, uh, okay, the sun has an 11 year cycle. Um, however, the sun's heat and light does not uh, change very, very much at all during that 11 year cycle, perhaps 0.1%. Now that is not gonna have a substantial um, sort of cyclic effect on uh, on our climate that very slight change in um, in energy output and by energy I mean heat and light but bearing in mind the sun's magnetic uh, strength varies from very very low to relatively high over 11 years and that can affect the earth in other ways so I, mm. I do not want to go into much detail about it but I reckon there is there is um, a need for more research into the uh, the changes in the sun's magnetic um, properties and how that might affect the earth and uh, the reason being that there was a, a time from about 1650 to about 1720 when uh, there were effectively no sunspots visible at all and but uh, when i say no uh, when a sunspot appeared that was big news you know it was on front page um, 
on newspapers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a sunspot on the sun today, and that's not uh, a police uh, lyric, but um, and so and it just so happened that during this period, which is called the Maunder Minimum uh, of very low solar activity, uh, this led to very very cold um, winters in the northern hemisphere. Uh, winters so so cold, and this is not. Um, every winter during this period of time, but there were um, cold winters when the, the Thames froze over and they were able to hold uh, ice fairs on the mm. uh, solid, frozen solid, at least on the, the top of the Thames. And um, so that in many ways is a little bit too coincidental that during a mm. time of extended low solar activity, there were um, uh, unusually cold winters in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's, as it is erroneously termed a mini ice age, but the average temperature only was probably half a degree cooler than than average. <laughs> uh, but that was nev nevertheless enough to um, cause these uh, unusually cold winters from time to time. Uh, and I have to stress, not every winter was cold enough for uh, the Thames to freeze over in other rivers, but uh, there were more times than than not. Uh, when this did happen. So so to me, that is a bit too coincidental. Uh, so it, it tends to suggest that um, perhaps the sun's magnetic cycle has can have, um, uh, if it is a prolonged um, lull in solar activity, can uh, affect our climate. So uh, that's probably all I'll um, want to say on that, because but it is a very controversial uh, situation. Oh, understood. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's about all we can see on the sun uh, on the sun today. But if you wouldn't mind, I'll uh, show you a video of um, of the, uh, just a few days ago of the, uh, the sun, and we'll finish off there. So I'll stop sharing yeah. this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, in in the meantime, Russell, we've yeah. got a um, one of our um, regular members. Um, actually, I'm not too sure of their name, but uh, make more memories. Wants to know if our next raffle is going to be a lunt. Well, <laughs> what well, do you reckon? That sounds like a pretty good idea, really. Absolutely, get more find, people find involved in solar one. observation. Yes, that's <laughs> something to put to our uh, committee. The twenty sixth of the tenth. Um, so I'll play this video and then I'll share it. Just make mm -hmm. sure it's the, the right one. And then we will finish off. Just play some music. <laughs> I, I've, I don't think I've got any that uh, is royalty free at the moment. Uh, oh, that's a shame. Gee, my video program doesn't seem to want to load up at the moment. How useless is that? Anyway. I'm asking it to play. Here we go. Finally. Maybe is it, is it playing or? It's um, it's trying to play. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It worked yesterday. In uh, as a practice. Yeah. It's just not coming up with anything. What a nuisance. Can you see it on your uh, computer, Russ? I, this one is... If you can see it, we can share what you're seeing. Yes, I, I will indeed. I'll uh, share that now. There we go. Okay, I'll add it to the stream now. Thanks That's a lot. It. I'll just let that cycle through. Once again, just playing around with the gain and the exposure to bring those uh, prominences out. I hopefully you're uh, able to see that now. Oodles of prominences around the yeah, look at them. Sun. Just just three days ago, the twenty sixth. Well, that's five days ago, but oodles of sunspots. Uh, so what was, <laughs> so what was the the time frame of the of this video? Um, 
30 seconds. Uh, like how long was the um, the overall time of that uh, that it took to, to take that? A 30 was seconds. Only, it actually 30, was only 30 seconds. Oh, 30, okay. 30 seconds, yes. But I played around with the, the gain, so I, I right. started off with, with the uh, settings just right for the chromosphere, and then I cranked up the exposure mm. and the, the gain to bring the prominences out to, well, to be, uh, to be, to, to be burnt out effectively, just to highlight. Well, and this one here was very impressive because it was as bright yeah. as the chromosphere, and that's a very good indication that solar activity is rising quite steadily. Because normally, uh, during low solar activity, the prominences are quite a deal um, fainter than the chromosphere, and they only show up a little bit like today, when the uh, the gain is cranked right up. But when we go back to the start, there we go. You can just see it, just see it. Yeah. With the normal exposure. So that's a that is a wonderful thing as the solar activity rises, that. Uh, the prominence will be seen uh, with the normally exposed chromosphere. So that is the beauty of solar observation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. The sun, our star, is it changes by the hour, changes by the day, and changes mm. by the year. So it's always uh, giving us something to something different to enjoy. Hmm. Well, that was excellent, Russell. And, um, and Lee, thank very, you very, very much. Well. That was... Um, okay, I'll stop sharing that, Kim. I'm sure that's got a lot of people interested, actually. Um, mm. I mean, it's quite a dynamic thing. You can do it during the very daytime much. and still get your sleep, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly it. Well, I am an astrophotographer as well, Kim, so oh, I do right. know it's... what late nights... Can do. Yeah, but, I didn't uh, get home yeah, until last night after that live stream event, and uh, I'm feeling yeah. it today. I tell you, <laughs> uh, that was fantastic. I've not looked through very, very well. the sun for a long, long time, um, and back then it was the wrong way to do it. And right. You don't even want to go there. It's just way, way too risky. So there are no telescopes, yeah. dedicated telescopes, and uh, yes. again, there's. I imagine there's stream live streams on the internet as well. Apart right. from this one, uh, where, where, you, where you perhaps do get almost 24-7 coverage, if that's possible. There are, yes. And uh, mm. if anyone is um, interested in that, please, I don't know, contact the uh, ASV or ASA, and uh, I'll, we'll be happy to provide some links to what is available out there for almost real-time solar observing. There's uh, so much available, it's terrific. And it's really, it is a wonderful time to be alive with... Um, mm with, uh, well, just to be alive with all the information that is available to us, uh, mm. just at the touch of a, of a button uh, through the so internet. It's, it's a combination of the technology and the availability, I guess, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, something you um, you were, uh, actually touched on, uh, just going back a fair bit, um, Kim, you sort of said, you know, you mentioned um, uh, sort of, you know, you, you imagined how dangerous it would be for the telescope itself, like in your know, normal telescopes, as it was. Mm. Um, my one, mine's as opposed to the Lunt, mine's a good example of that. Where I, it was a few weeks ago, I um, I was getting set up for uh, some morning viewing, and I didn't have the solar filter on the front, but I had already slewed around, thinking that I knew I would have to uh, adjust before I got, you know on the sun but i just happened to because i move the scope around quite regularly somehow i must have even in this different position had perfect polar alignment and it had gone straight to the sun without having my solar filter on and i've kind of put it on and later on i'm looking at this uh, at the view and i'm thinking i don't know what these lines are on the on the the thing and i thought We've got these little icicle lights hanging down from the garage. I thought maybe it's those. That, that, that's probably what it is. But as the scope moved around further, still there. And I thought that, that can't be right. And um, anyway, I had a look a little bit later on and I, I pulled my filter apart, my filter wheel apart to clean it and realized my red filter had cracked. Wow. So mm. just that, that few seconds of having the light from, you know, obviously uh magnified through the scope and hitting the red filter mm. 
mm. was enough to to raise the temperature probably a few hundred degrees and it's just mm. gone yes. crack and i'm extremely lucky mm. that it didn't um damage the camera at the you know mm -hmm. at the other end of it so yes yeah well i, I lost a t-shirt when i was a teenager uh, doing something similar <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember the old? Um, you used to get these refractors uh, in department stores, and they had the like a solar projection system in them. Yeah. Where you oh, yes. them right, and it was at right angles, right? And I think yeah. I, I'd taken off the right angle uh, prism, and whatever Sorry, I was no, doing, yeah. then, I just noticed all the smoke coming from my t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'd copped it, and uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's it's instant. It's, ex it's extremely yes. hazardous. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm 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 always mindful now, like putting that the the solar filter on straight away. But also mm. because I've still got a finder oh, scope oh, on oh, and my guide scope. camera, I oh. cover the guide camera so I don't damage yeah. you know, the camera there. Yeah. But with the finder scope, I also as soon as I've slewed around, I actually use my hand <laughs> behind that to mm. see if I'm in roughly the right spot. But mm. I also then take my hand back and forth just to make sure I'm not seeing it it go to a, a point somewhere that's going to start a fire in the garage so <laughs> yeah you know, so yeah. Um, yeah you've just got to take those measures no extra, extra but the, uh, the i think the summary is that it is very dangerous to observe absolutely if yeah there, if there are, are any doubts about whether the equipment is uh, capable of doing it the answer is don't do it yeah, absolutely. yeah. You're, absolutely, you're absolutely sure that uh, you understand the dangers and the, the dangers are um, mitigated mm. all right. right so kevin kevin has put up a, a link to the solar dynamics observatory uh, yeah. website and i think that's yeah. a good place to go as well that is a mm. terrific right. uh, place to go to thanks kevin a terrific place yeah Okay, uh, well, that's uh, just over an hour, so I think we are done for the day. And, in fact, for Vic South for 2021. Yes. Our online version. So this is the last presentation. So um, thank you, thank you, Russ, and thanks, Lee. Uh, Very well. Wonderful presentation. Uh, fascinating. I'm sure it's going to stimulate a few people to get out there and do some solar astronomy. That's, that was great. Um, Fantastic. Have a great day and enjoy the sunshine, especially you folk <laughs> over in Victoria. We we, we get a little bit more, but not much. <laughs> but uh, yeah. make the most of it. And till next time, I guess, till next Big South, wherever that yeah. may be. And hopefully it's, <laughs> um, hopefully it's in person. In um, person. That'll, yeah. be, that'll be something unique. Yeah. All yeah. right. And until okay. then, I'll just sign off. And yep. uh, until then, cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Cheers. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.